Jordan, welcome to Real Talks, man. I appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me. This is great. Awesome. I, I really want to know, how'd you go from someone that went viral for taking taking a complete <laughs> stranger around the world yeah. because she had your ex's last name to somebody that now has co-founded a very successful men mental health company? Yeah, I guess when you play it that way, it is a bit of a leap. Um, in effect, <laughs> I mean, you know, my viral experience was not um, great for my mental health, to put it mildly. I, uh, you know, look, I, I had a, a lot of stuff yeah, that I crammed away for a long time from my upbringing and, and, and school years. And the moment of virality, it was kind of like you could reinvent yourself to be any person you want to be in the eyes of the media and and... I played that game for a bit. And then I realized that I was trying to fix something uh, very deep inside of me. And as I began to sort of peek in there, it got pretty dark and messed up. And so as soon as I could get away from that viral story, which was a pure accident, by the way, <laughs> um, as soon as I could get away from it, I really like I, I got in, I was in an incredibly dark place for about a year. And during that time, I started to, um, ask a lot of questions of, of myself and other people, uh, kind of like what you guys are doing with the show of, of, you know, how can I learn from others? How can I try to triangulate information to make sense of what I just experienced, but not because I'm like a special star or, uh, you know, a super unique person or anything like that. Like I'm very much an every kind of person. I'm a very average person across the board. I'm like an average weight, average height, average IQ, you know, <laughs> like, and, and, and so I, I started to have kind of this beginner's minds mindset around, well, why did I feel like this? Why had I been suppressing so many challenges and why was that moment of virality initially something that was really, um, soothing and exciting until it became terrifying. And going down that rabbit hole, I ended up just, um, I ended up meeting eventually um, my now uh, fiance um, and we have, and she's a therapist. She was not my therapist. I want to make that very clear, um, <laughs> but it, she's a therapist. And we started a podcast together called Imposter Cast. And it was all about stories of people who fake it. Um, and And, and during that, we started to lay the foundation for what would become our business, um, where it's one part clinicians. We have therapists all over Canada that support people all over the world uh, with individual therapy and counseling. And then we have uh, another side of the business that does mental health education and training. Um, and I think I brought to that, to answer your question, I brought to the mix of that, I think a little bit of the One of my talents has been sort of naturally like, how can I take something boring and make it kind of interesting or engaging for people? Um, you know, maybe that had something to do with the viral story and why it got so big. I don't know. But that was always kind of one of my talents. So, so when I started to look at like mental health education and training for myself, I was like, oh, my God, this is so bland and boring. And so I started to work with Megan to create more interesting products and ways of thinking about things. So basically I would take the clinical knowledge from her and figure out how to wrap it in something that was more, um, it, it was stickier for, for people. And that's how I ended up here today. And now it's like the company is way beyond the two of us. We have like, it's crazy. We have almost a hundred people. Um, like I was just on our Slack channel and every time I see like, you know, 96 people, I'm like, <laughs> whoa, like it, it kind of hits me. Um, so yeah, so it was really that journey, I think of, of, of certainly like doing my own self -ex exploration, but then some serendipity of, of meeting Megan and then having the opportunity to collaborate and leading that into a business. That's awesome. And it's an amazing story. So when you were doing this self exploration and trying to answer these questions that a lot of us have, like, why am I feeling this way? And yeah if I have all this virality and uh, I'm famous and I'm doing well, why, why am I still feeling that way? So what did that self exploration of yours entail? Oh man, I wish I had some kind of roadmap at the time. because I, I sort of tried a little bit of everything. Like, so I think what, it, it, you know, contextually I'll share this. So as part of that viral story, it unlocked like it not, no pun intended, but like a world of opportunity. Like all of a sudden, my life rights were bought by a movie studio. All of a sudden, we were filming a TV show starring me. All of a sudden, I had a book agent, a speaking agent, all these people. And then everyone was kind of looking at me being like, okay, what do you want to say? 
And anything that I wanted to say or do didn't jive with them because they wanted me to like do like a reality show where, you know, a stranger dates five women with the same name or something like that. Like it it was going to be, you know, like that's what they wanted. But what I wanted was like, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to try to do something more meaningful with it. And I ended up just striking out on all accounts. And so it was like I held a lot of shame and anger during that whole viral story because it I inadvertently. Um, humiliated my ex, who's a wonderful person. Um, and, and we really loved each other and cared about each other. We were just incompatible, mostly because I was at the time, I mean, I was a workaholic nightmare of a person that was like trying to fill this bottomless pit of ambition and going in circles and not realizing that I have ADHD and not properly working on my depression and anxiety. And, and so uh, when given all the opportunity in the world, it, you kind of feel like, okay, well, this is going to fix something, right? And then when it didn't and everything I was doing just sort of fell apart, I did too. And when I bottomed out there, like, honestly, dude, it was, it was dark. Like it was seriously dark. Like I was like, I lived on the second floor of a third floor of a building. And I like taped my windows shut. My therapist was like, tape your window shut because she was worried that I would open it up one night and jump out. Um, And that was just kind of where I was. I kind of didn't see you know, for anyone that's that's listening, that's ever felt that kind of darkness in your life, you know that you have a kind of tunnel vision. It's all you can kind of see. And you can't see that far into the tunnel. You just sort of see what's right in front of you. And you think, okay, I can't live like this. So, and so during that, I, I was fortunate enough. Um, so it, there was one particular moment that really stands out. And I'm a big believer that there's no one moment that changes everything, but this moment kind of set me on a path of seeing things a little differently. So that was this. I So one of the things that we tried to create as part of this viral story, uh, after the viral story, riding the wave of it was a travel app where um, you it was called uh, Triplust, which in hindsight was a terrible name, uh, mm-hmm. to where you could, you could essentially um, get connected with locals, not to fall in love, but for travel advice. <laughs> and, and we actually got some venture funding for it. We had like a founding team. None of us had any idea of what it was to like build a, a company like that. And it totally fell apart with this investment money behind us. But during that, I met this, this guy that became a bit of a mentor to me. And um, he would check in with me about every week and, and see how I was doing. And I ended up kind of like dodging his calls and emails for a couple of weeks when I was really in this pit. Um, at that point, my founding team had blown apart. I felt this, again, this huge amount of shame and failure. And he, I, he ended up calling me one day and I picked up the phone after dodging him for a couple of weeks. And he just heard something in my voice that spooked him. And he hung up the phone and he ended up flying down that night from another city to where I was um, and, and showed up unannounced and like damn near broke in my door. I was shocked. It was the middle of the night he showed up and um, he sat me down and he was just like, Hey, I'm worried about you. That's why I came here. Sit down, start talking. And it wasn't like talking, like you talk to a therapist necessarily, although I, I, I was speaking with a therapist and that was really helpful too at that time, but it was more around like, Hey, I see you here right now. You're in this dark place where I'm worried you're going to hurt yourself. Tell me about the first time you ever felt this way. Tell me about the first time you ever felt like you weren't enough, that you had to hide, that you had to do this and that. And so I started sharing a lot of these memories that have been percolating in my mind. And I started sharing for the first time, I think, how much shame and embarrassment and guilt and frustration I was holding on to um, from early years of my life. And then I kind of realized that this viral thing was really just like the peak of that feeling for me. And over like four or five hours, he kind of kept asking these questions and pulling more and more out of me. And we arrived kind of at this point where I felt like I kind of shared everything that I could cognitively at that point in time. Like I just kind of put it all out there. Of course, there was more memories and stuff, but like in terms of trying to put a narrative to this and trying to see, look backwards and be like, how did I get here? And at the end of it, I was like, you know, shaking and like terrified because I never really said a lot of this stuff out loud. And he just kind of looked at me and he was like, you know, dude, I get it. And I was kind of like, what do you, what do you mean? And 
he then let, went into this huge, crazy story that like blew my mind about the things that he had experienced. And it was, of course, you know, events were different, but you know, this guy who had a very different, like, you know, he, he was, he had a very different upbringing. He had a very different life than me. He had a very different um, socioeconomic background. He had all these th things that were different than me, but he, w the thing that we had shared was like this, this tightrope that we all kind of walk between ourselves and our own dreams and our own pain. And he took me through his journey. And then he said, see, like, again, he's like, see, I get it. Like, I don't, get exactly what it was like. I don't get the exact events. I wasn't there, but I know how it feels. And that was kind of the first time in my life where I was like, okay, hold the phone. So this guy who I look up to that's acting as a mentor to me, who's like really well-established and well-respected, this guy's telling me that he's been in this dark place too, in his own way. And that kind of blew my mind because, you know, we look at the people that are around us, the people that are you know, whose books we're reading, who's, who are on stages, who are coaching us, who are, you know, people even in our lives, like our, our parents or uncles or whatever, the people that we look up to. And it's not like we think they have it all figured out. I mean, I think we've all kind of accepted that really no one knows what the fuck they're doing anytime, excuse my language. Um, but that like the idea that they hurt as much as we hurt, right? At some point in their lives, like that, that was something kind of new to me. And, and so I started from that moment. I mean, it wasn't like an instantaneous thing. It took a lot of encouragement from him, but I started to be more open with people immediately in my life around some of this pain that I've been holding on to. And then that just sort of like led to one thing to another. And I ended up just like a couple times making some posts on my personal Facebook, just like, you know, putting some of these pieces together. And the response was like really surprising. Like people that I thought from my past, like even people that like, you know, like bullied me and people that I thought for all intents and purposes, like hated me, um, you know, like they reached out with their, not to like say like, oh, I'm so sorry you felt like that, but rather to share their own experiences. And that just kind of ended up accelerating. Like, and all of a sudden I kind of over the span of like that darkness to like six months later, I sort of came to the conclusion that, you know, everyone has this, this thing that they hold on to. And like, eventually we start a program looking at that thing called what's your big lie. But, um, you know, the kind of this lie that we live, that we, we manufacture over years and years and years, and it's really hard to sh uh, strip that away. And all of us, again, struggle with that shame of what if they knew the truth? Um, so it was really like starting to look at things that way, but I want to underline, like, because I, I think it's really important. Sometimes we oversimplify things and like, it's like, you know, we say, well, if, if, you know, if you find that one person and confide within them, then you'll be fine too. Fuck that. It, you should <laughs> like, that's good, but it takes work to get out of a place like that. And believe me, like after that, things only got worse initially and then they got better and then they got worse again. And then they got a bit better and then they got even better. And then they got really bad again. Like Megan calls that the, the progress noodle. Like, cause that's what it is. Like, it's not like getting out of a dark messed up place is linear or even non-linear. It's like, it's a loop-de-loop. -loop. You backslide like crazy. And, and then you're like, oh God, I'm getting worse again. What am I doing wrong? Did I make the same mistakes over and over again? And then, <laughs> and then, you know, you start accelerating out of that and you're like, okay, no, I wait, I have learned, I have grown. And so it was, it was honestly a lot of that. The other thing I'll say too, just on a, on a tactical level, like I also got diagnosed, um, with ADHD, which explains a lot of my, you know, a lot of my past pain and shame was based around the fact that I couldn't sit still and pay attention or be present with people. Um, and, and the compounding effects of that from, from childhood onwards. Um, and so that was really important too, to like, actually like take care of like my actual clinical mental health needs and deal with that in addition to this personal discovery. And like, it, it sort of goes hand in hand, I found. That's awesome. And, and thank you for sharing that, man. I, <laughs> no I appreciate it. <laughs> that was a longer I, answer than you bargained for, but no, hey. <laughs> no, I, I love long answers because they really go in depth. And I've also heard you talk about um, MDMA assisted therapy. Is that something yep. that you, that you were doing at the time as well? Yeah. Where did you see me talking about that? I'm curious. <laughs> In is another it, podcast. A video? Really? Uh, not okay. a video. Yeah. A podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. I, I, so yeah. So um, 
look, I'll be honest, like MDMA and psilocybin assisted therapy were also part of my journey. I wasn't sure if I was going to go here in this conversation, (laughs) Um, but this is not a call to go ahead and do it. I want to be really clear. I'm a big believer. um, I mean, I, I had someone in my life who was very skilled at taking people through that journey. And without that person or that clinician, it's not a good thing to do. It's not something you you get a lot out of if you just do it with friends and don't know what you're getting into. But it is transformative if it's set up in the right way uh, with, with a trusted person. And there's more and more like legalization of MDMA-assisted therapy and, and mushroom psilocybin-assisted therapy all over the place. And, and both are really transformative. Um, I would say, you know, after my first experience with MDMA assisted therapy, and I've had a bunch, but after my first one, it kind of felt like, um, you know, something I said afterwards, and I don't think this is entirely true, but it's punchy, uh, is it kind of felt like I did six years of therapy in six hours. But I want to underline, you don't actually do six years of therapy in six hours. You, you, may, you may develop like a lot of in, internal awareness that you, you would take a long time to get through more traditional means, but integration of it into your life and practicing it and keeping it up is super hard. And that's why it's important to do like that with a supported, you know, someone that does it all the time or some that, that not as a party drug, but like <laughs> someone that, that does the, the therapy all the time with individuals or in conjunction with traditional therapy, because if you just kind of, you know, take the blue pill, so to speak, and expect to wake up and feel better, you might be more clear, but you're not really, you're not going to, you're going to be overwhelmed about what to do with that. And it, that, that is super scary. I, I, I was there. Um, yeah. So both are amazing. They really are. I, but I would advocate, like, honestly, if I had the choice to take ADHD drugs, um, I take Vyvanse, which is like way chiller than Adderall. You know, we have mm-hmm. the idea of Adderall in students. Yeah. Um, Adderall is awful. It's like up and down and you like shake and it, it's terrible for me. But Vyvanse is like a savior to me because I can actually sit still and be here and focused on you right now in this conversation. And my whole life, I couldn't do that. And so if someone said to me, knowing what I know now, if you could only choose one of the two, be diagnosed with ADHD and really work on that, or use psilocybin or MDMA assisted therapy, I would choose ADHD any time of day. Um, Because there's other ways to find that growth. It just, it may not be, um, it may not be as efficient. Um, Mm. That's all. In my case, at least, it's each their own. I also know a lot of people that have done MDMA assisted therapy and psilocybin therapy, and it, it just hasn't worked for them. So, I mean, it really depends on what you're dealing with, especially like people with complex trauma. Like MDMA assisted therapy and psilocybin can be super scary. Um, like, it, it, and so it really, and that's just like one example, but it can, it's something I think what I'm trying to say is it's something that is very powerful, but it's something that you have to be very cautious of too. Um, and, and only pursue in a way that with like people that are really practiced. Yes, for sure. And hopefully with the like legalization of this, we can have more people like your friend and people can really find them a lot easier because obviously now since it's illegal or, or criminalized in most places, it's super hard with somebody that's struggling with a certain problem to find that person. So it, it is, you got, you got to know someone who knows someone. And then even then you feel like you're doing something super illegal, even though it's on the verge of legalization, like in Canada, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm in Canada and I, I wouldn't <laughs> be surprised if it's, if psilocybin is legalized in the next three years, there's already companies that are charging out of the gates and raising tons of venture capital, um, building pre and post, um, experience pro- uh, uh, products. Uh, like before your psilocybin journey and afterwards and, and like journals of how to integrate your learnings and like broader treatment protocols. And, and there's foundations popping up in the States and in Canada that use psilocybin to help um, uh, people coming back from that have come back from Iraq and Afghanistan help with processing trauma. Like, so this is something that's very real. It's very clinically backed. 
And it's a matter of time, but it, for now, it's even scarier. It's kind of like the argument of mar uh, legalizing marijuana, right? Like, it's kind of like, okay, well, if we legalize marijuana, then at least there's going to be solid supply chains and a sense of quality control, and it's going to be more controlled, and then we can do public education on it. And guess what? I would argue, I mean, weed's been legal here in Canada for, I don't know, five years now. I would argue that probably less people smoke weed now than they did before. <laughs> um, and, and I think like, you know, it's not because if we legalize, everyone's going to go ahead and do it. What I do worry though about psilocybin and MDMA is like, we have to be very realistic around its benefits and what it can do, because if it's just kind of positioned as the miracle drug, I think it's going to set a lot of people up for some pretty serious hard times. Um, yeah, it's going to be fascinating. I, I, I don't know what the laws are there in Europe with psilocybin and MDMA. I'm guessing there's probably research and stuff, but it's still probably fairly um, uh, I'm not borderline very illegal. well acquainted with it, with it either. I know in Amsterdam, I think both, both of them are decriminalized. Uh, oh, yeah. Psilocybin Amsterdam. mushrooms. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> I think in the Netherlands in general. But uh, psilocybin mushrooms, are you can't really buy them there. You can only buy like okay. truffles which I think uh, has psilocybin, but I don't know yeah. what the difference is really. But in the U.S., it's also yeah. making a lot of headway. And I yeah. work, work in a marketing company and we we have as clients one of the companies that's public in Canada. It's called Bright Minds and they're like developing their own sort of psychedelic drugs. So yeah, definitely Great, this cool. I'll is, check it out. in in like... Um, five to 10 years, this is going to be an option for people, which is oh, yeah. one super promising. Yeah. And we're, we're like, it's, you know, there's a lot of active conversations and even training that's going on with our therapists now. So we have like of our almost hundred people, we have around 80 of them are therapists. And so it's something that like a therapist, like frontline clinicians that have been in the game for like 15, 20 years, it's something very much that's on their radar. Right. Hmm. And but it's, it's still not going to be something where it's like, you know, in 10 years, you go into a doctor's office and they give you like a bag of mushrooms and you go home and they yeah, tell you to you snack it on it. Like it's, yeah, you, you do it there in a controlled treatment. It's probably going to be more treatment center based where you're there for a couple of days. There's going to be a lot of, it's almost like it's going to be like going to a detox facility or a rehab, right? Like it, it, it's going to be that kind of treatment because it's super reckless otherwise. Um, but yeah, I mean, it look, honestly, like I would be lying if I said it didn't do a great deal for me. I think it is one of the reasons that I bounced back relatively quickly considering what a dark place I was in. Um, I'll give a credit to that. But I will also say it didn't make anything go away. The challenges, the pains, everything was still there. It's just you kind of know yourself bet a little better of, of why you are the way you are. And, and sometimes that's a good chunk of the battle. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it really helps you make amends with that big lie and yep. uh, knowing yourself better, I think also helps in that next step of opening up, being vulnerable and developing the programs that, that you develop to help other people do the same thing. Yeah. I mean, it, it's really about tackling the beliefs you have about yourself. Um, and, and, you know, we all have a, a set of beliefs that have been ingrained in us um, from the people around us and how we've reacted to situations that we're in, to the self-talk that we uh, tell ourselves. We all have that stuff that's been around our whole lives. Um, you know, we have that noisy roommate in our head that's always talking <laughs> away about how we're not good enough, smart enough, or not this or that. And like, you know, if that person was a real person, we would hate them. We like the voice in our heads. Like if they were our actual physical roommate, we'd be like, I'm moving out of this place. This place sucks. This guy sucks. Uh, this person sucks. And, and so like, it's, you know, it, 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 it psilocybin and MDMA, like it can help you see why you have the beliefs about yourself and about the world that you do. And it can help you to your point, make amends with those beliefs and, and sort of like, I want to say, I don't want to say you forgive yourself because I think that's an overstatement. It takes a lot for people to forgive themselves. Um, but you can kind of see like you as, I mean, and this is just my experience, right? But like, I kind of saw like a lot of the, like the inner child in me that was really hurt um, many times at a young age. And I sort of saw that kid and I could kind of like, I don't want to say, hug him because that's kind of weird but like i could kind of just like i could kind of like look at him and be like i know it sucks but it's going to be okay 
And that was kind of freeing for me in present day me to know that, you know, like this kid that was so full of life and so full of joy that ultimately I would let him down for a very long time, but that there's something else later. Um, I think one of the big cancers that we struggle with and like the big lie and everything else is we, we really do believe, I, I feel like that we, we really define our lives as if we're just one story. Um, and, and the story is like our narrative arc is kind of what it is. And if we miss that window of opportunity, then it's gone. Like the classic Disney structure for a story is once upon a time, there was a blank, but then blank and then blank, right? It's like, you know, and, and that's just like kind of like the hero's journey to like all, all that shit. And the problem is with that is we believe reality is that simple and that our lives are that simple. Like the amount of people that I've met who like flush their lives down the toilet repeatedly, um, like at like 18 and then at 22 and then at like 35 and then at 36 and then like, you know, and just went through this regeneration and, and always kind of like, it could just, I don't want to say pick themselves back up because that's again, an overstatement, but they figured out how to, um, how to have something in them where they just didn't give up or where they kept pushing. They kept trying to find something in them to help them give it another shot. Um, and not just sort of say, screw it and just, you know, stop working on themselves or stop working on their businesses or whatever it was. I mean, the amount of people that have that experience is really astounding. And so, you know, it's like, I don't know, when we're in it, we can't see the chapters of our lives, but kind of when you're in that altered state with MDMA, with psilocybin, um, or with a lot of therapy for that matter, like you can totally start to, to bookend things. And that is that's a really helpful tool. And like, just to speak to like your audience for a second, I mean, I know this shows for students, like, fuck me when I was, excuse my language, but like when I was in college, when I was in university, man, I was so damn hard on myself. I studied political science because I wanted to feel important. Um, I went to the University of Ottawa, which is like right next to Canada's parliament buildings, because I wanted to feel important. I wanted to be in close proximity of power. And then after that, when I had the opportunity to work for the federal government and do God knows what fucking paperwork the rest of my life, but no offense to anyone that wants to go into government, um, then I was just like, I was so hard on myself. Like, I thought I really wanted this. If I don't say yes to this, then what's going to, then I'm just going to end up working at a gas station or something. Again, nothing that works, you know, <laughs> nothing to get, no knocks there, but like, it's, it's, it's all the stakes feel so high, don't they? And, and that is just like, it's, it's the all or nothing thinking we societally have just kind of adopted and it's, it's exhausting. Um, so I just, I, I, and all this is to say is like for your listeners, like you don't have to rush out and and find someone to do MDMA therapy or psilocybin <laughs> with you, but you, but whatever you can do and teach their own, but whatever you can do to try to define the chapters of your life so far and look back, it'll help you really believe that if something works out or doesn't, or if you shit the bed on something, or if you nail something, even in the future, it's, that's not going to be the thing necessarily either. And that's okay. And then you kind of develop this freedom of like, okay, I can kind of experiment and play around in my life and have fun and see what brings me joy and see what brings me pain and not define myself by it. And that is like, that is the sweet spot to be in. Not that I'm really there much occasionally on my good days, but like, <laughs> I mean, that is, that's like the Holy grail. Right. Um, so it's, I mean, you know, I, I don't know where I was going with that, but suffice to say it's, you know, <laughs> I don't know. No. Everyone's on their own journey. Right. No, and it makes a lot a lot of sense what you said that we see these movies, we see the hero's journey, and we think that life is linear. But in reality, especially now that we have so much change and so much innovation and COVID and things are changing yeah. so rapidly, like we're gonna have to reinvent ourselves multiple times in our lives. Like you've reinvented yourself For multiple sure. times. And that's that's gonna be the norm. So if we yeah. really do think that way, then I could easily see how we could uh, be down or go crazy or whatever, because so much change is going on that, as I said, we're going to have to reinvent ourselves multiple times and yeah. have that mindset that you say that, that you mentioned, which is 
Okay, I could experiment. I could mess around. Yeah, and I'm yeah, that beginner's be mindset, right? Like that curious beginner's mindset. I can't remember who came up with that 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 phrase, but it's really valuable if you can start to treat yourself that way as like a curious learner, rather than the thing that we all do, which is like rush to judgment of ourselves. Um, like play around with it, see what feels right and get comfortable with change because it's only going to accelerate. I mean, the old saying, like just talk careers for a second, like the old saying was what? Like most adults will have two to three different careers in their lives. Uh -uh. It's <laughs> for our generation. It's going to be way more than that. Like, I don't know. I, I doubt it's going to be like every year, but I mean, gone are the days where someone works for a company for like 20 years or even yeah. in the same field for 20 years. That's going to be the vast minority of people. And probably only if you have super specialized education, where if you leave, you're going to like feel like, who am I? Because I've defined my whole self by this, even though I want to do all these other things. But that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but change is something that we got to get comfortable with. And so the key, as I've learned from, from you know, in my own journey and, and from those of people that I'm close with and our clients is like, the thing is, is to kind of have that North Star of who you are, because the world and everything we do within it is going to change anyway. And so you got to figure out how to be your own constant, right? Like everything else is a variable, but you're a constant. And how can we remain, like when you say you being that constant? How can we remain a constant, but still, you know, morph into different careers, morph into different interests? Does that constant need to be defined? As you said, curious, is it more like values or how mm. do we even go about defining this constant? You have to ask the hard question, eh? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, I think, I think it really helps to, so, okay. So I think sometimes it's easier to, define ourselves by what we aren't rather than what we are. And I think you could start there, right? So like, what are some basic things that you're not going to believe or do in your life? Um, I'm serious. Like, I am not going to steal. I am going to try to be honest with other people. I am going to invest in only the closest of friendships. I am going to figure out how to laugh once a day. I like, <laughs> I, because I, I just gave a bunch of things that are in the affirmative, but like those sorts of basic activities and beliefs and values that are important to you, having not like, you don't have to have like a laundry list of them. You, you don't have to make it into like a personal constitution or something, but just having a couple things um, is really helpful. So one of the things that I remind myself of most days is whatever is going on in here in my head for podcast listeners, I can't see, I'm pointing at my head. Whatever's going on in here right now, I am not the only one thinking that right now. In fact, even in my immediate friend group or in my company, I am definitely not the only person feeling that way. Like odds are anything that I'm experiencing, someone else is too. And so that little core belief helps me just reconcile any inner crap that's going on in any moment. And that to me is something that's really important to me about me. So I make it a priority. I, hmm. and, and so whatever that belief is, maybe the belief is just like that I'm not alone. That's something that's a North Star for me. Um, so it's those kinds of things that I find really helpful um, to, to anchor yourself or else you're going to feel lost. Um, it's kind of like, you know, I don't know, maybe it's just because I'm in like business owner mindset, but it's kind of like, so right now, like, we, we have a largely, most of our business is the therapy business. Therapy is changing dramatically, not just because of psilocybin and all that stuff that we talked about, but also just COVID accelerated virtual care in a way that no one would have saw coming. Like, of course, virtual care was going to go primary virtually over the next 10 years, but like it really gave it a kick in the ass. And we are struggling to figure out how we compete in that world now, because People aren't just going to the local therapist on the corner now. You can see any therapist that's regulated in your, your province, your, your state, your country, right? And, and so the floodgates have opened. And one of the things that we are trying to do as a company, and we tried to do, I think is like not really focus on the what that we're going to do or really the why or the how, but rather like what do we ultimately believe as a business and what are our guiding principles? So like one of our guiding principles that's really important to us is to think like an owner. And that's a shared thing. 
So what does it mean to think like an owner? Well, it means that you're going to give a shit, a lot of shits. It means that you're going to treat money <laughs> as zero. It means you're going to care about your clients probably way more than you should. It, you know, it means all these different things. And so if we go back to those, the path kind of shows itself and we can react to change and we can react to that change and make friends with it because we know that ultimately like what we do is changing, but why we do it isn't. And that's, that's sort of the, that's sort of the thing. So if you ask me if I could go back in time, three minutes and give you a concise answer, it would be that it's like the, what changes of our lives, but hopefully our why or our why not is pretty well anchored. Yeah. And your why is very interesting as well, because it entails that you're not alone. And I feel that a lot of problems that we might have, especially mental health problems like depression could come from thinking that we're the only person feeling this way or thinking that nobody else has gone through this suffering, you know? Yeah, totally. Like a guy was interviewing me for a book yesterday that I was writing. Super interesting, dude. I'm excited for his book to come out. And, and it's all about the guilt of, of being an immigrant and the concessions that his parents had to make for him to lead a, um, a, a life in a democratic society that his parents couldn't. And how do you reconcile that guilt and shame, right? Like pretty big question. <laughs> and he was kind of like, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. No one's going to read it. I'm nervous that, you know, it's not going to resonate. It didn't say quite like that, but he was alluding to that. I don't want to put words <laughs> in his mouth. And I was like excited. I was like, dude, do you know how many people have that same fucking experience? I can count like two hands isn't even enough for the amount of people <laughs> I know in my immediate life that are dealing with that. But I can't really think of many people speaking openly about it. It's something that tends to happen as backroom conversations more. Hmm. Right. And, and so you're speaking to a clear need for sure. And you've defined it super well. And there are other, there are so many people that are struggling with that. Just give it a name and, and then use your story as a mirror for others. And, and so like, that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of like the fundamental, this interview is really good for me. I'm kind of realizing my <laughs> fundamental principle, but like <laughs> fundamentally, like I approach every situation like this now, like I can meet anyone. And I can just sort of cut to the core and not be thrown off by who they are. Like, I, you know, Ugg Boots, that, that boots I think so, company? Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, yeah. So so I once had that. This isn't like a, a humble brag thing. This is like a <laughs> weird situation that I don't know how I ended up with. But I, I once had dinner with the owner and the founder of the business. He sold his business for like, I don't know, like a, a crazy amount, like $500 million or something. And I, wow. <laughs> I had dinner with them. And I, I won't share any of the contents of our conversation. Suffice to say, the whole time I was like, why am I having dinner with this dude? Like, what could I, like, like what could I possibly have to offer this guy? Um, and he's a great guy, super interesting and whatnot. But like, I ended up, we ended up at like, it, it, it was around 20 minutes in, it turned out that he was having this massive existential crisis the same way that I was at that time. And the person that hooked us up for dinner knew that. And it's kind of like, okay, this person <laughs> with like a very different thing going on than me is like, is, is, you know, in a, in the same spot of pain. And I don't know, it's just like, it's not to say like, you know, try to find the innermost pain of everyone you ever interact with. But like, if you use that of a lens of how you see relationships and the world and your opportunity to learn from others and experience things, it kind of is a beautiful thing. And it sort of reminds you, um, I don't know, it just kind of, I don't know, it keeps me just sort of grounded and human in my own stuff. And it doesn't solve my problems, but it at least makes them less scary. And that's a big part of all this stuff. And, and that's why I think it's so important to also share your story because you're, you're having dinner with that guy because your friend knew that you had gone through something similar. And if you never share your story, then people that are undergoing the same thing, they might not know that. Then the same thing yeah. happened to happened to me yesterday. Like I was uh, in this uh, like dinner and I was talking to this guy I had just met and I told him how I w went vegan because I interviewed someone and he really recommended the vegan diet. So I went vegan for like three months and then I started having problems like with libido and getting horny and all that. And I was like, why is this happening? Because I saw game changers and people there. Oh, game I, changers. I, yeah, yeah, dude. <laughs> I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a funny story about game changers. But anyways, yeah, keep going. 
and then people there were getting like bigger erections and stuff and this opposite's yeah. happening to me and i shared that because <laughs> it, it could be something intimate and the guy told me that the exact same thing had happened to him and then we sort of bonded over it and then and, and then we just concluded that we we like us personally had to eat meat in order to yeah. keep that balance but is that it, it all comes down to sharing your story no matter how vulnerable it is so because there's other people that have undergone the same thing yeah of course man and what i love about that example you just gave is it can also be just a micro challenge in our life yes. and 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 like not to say that your lack of libido <laughs> is a small problem <laughs> but just to say that like it's you know sometimes we have this idea like if i'm going to be vulnerable with other people then i have to tell them everything no, you don't. Yeah. You don't have to like, you don't have to sit someone down and be like, let me tell you about the first time that I didn't feel <laughs> loved. Like you, you, you don't have to do that. Like you can just share in the moment. Like sometimes it's as easy as like, I don't know. I do a lot of keynote speaking. And sometimes like if I feel vulnerable and weird when I'm on stage or sorry, uncomfortable when I first get out there, like the imposter voice is going, I'm like, who the hell am I? I will say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I'll be like, this is like, I, like guys like this is a pretty wild audience like i am i am feeling like a bit of a fraud right now and just by saying that and admitting that it's not like people look at me and be like oh this guy sucks because he feels like a fraud right now <laughs> yeah. if anything they're thinking oh you know what i actually feel like a fraud at this event too and this guy gets it right and then it's this bridge and so it's it can be a very much in the moment thing i think that's one of the things that i kind of you know like we have this program that we built for youth initially that it, it really took off in the campus world and then the corporate world called what's your big lie. And the idea was to get people to share their innermost challenges anonymously. And it's super amazing program. Great that use technology to get people to like share their stuff in a way they felt comfortable with. But the problem was, and in remains one of the biggest challenges of it is like, if we only focus on sharing the big thing, then that kind of reinforces a narrative that, that does keep us quiet the vast majority of time. And the, the counter to that is like, well, instead of sharing just the big lie, maybe you should start sharing like the little things every day in like a gradual way. And not like every day, not every interaction, because I'll just be annoying for you and everyone yeah. else. But like yeah. in those moments, like don't bite your tongue if you're if you're on a vegan diet and having libido problems, because the <laughs> footballers that they tested on in that movie, those guys were like probably <laughs> steroided up anyway. Like, I mean, <laughs> totally like not a representative population. Right. Yeah. And and I saw that movie, too. And I was like, oh, man, I got to really like <laughs> and, and and I cut back on my meat consumption since, which I think is kind of the healthy thing for me. Right. Right? without cutting it out entirely. But like, you know, I have a lot of insecurities around anything with like, you know, um, not anything, but like a lot around like my weight and stuff, like, cause I was pretty fat growing up. Right. And I'm naturally a fat guy. Like, so if I don't work out, I put on a lot of weight and then I feel like crap and I'm a new dad and feeling sluggish <laughs> and out of breath, like sucks like that. Right. And so it's like, you know, even just sort of speaking about that, like not on a platform, like a podcast or anything, but just with like the people in my life, like, it's like, oh, okay. You know? Oh, okay. Oh, here's an idea. Or here's a dialogue. Oh, you should, you have this problem too. Oh, well maybe let's go for a run together. Right. <laughs> Whatever it is. Like there's, yeah. there's this amazing beauty that comes where you sort of speak like the thing that you were just biting your tongue on. Yeah. And, and as you said, it doesn't have to be that one big lie, that one big thing, those small things also help. And I feel like, it helps even more if you've come to terms with it and you treat it in a way that's not a joke, but as something normal and something that you could laugh about. And yeah. then people that are holding their tongue, then they feel like, okay, then I, I could express myself too, you know? Yeah. Like laugh about, cry about, be neutral about whatever that reaction is, right? Like just getting that thing out there. Um, you know, like I, so we, we do like, um, we just finished like performance reviews and, and, and stuff in our company. And one of my favorite things to do with, with employees and colleagues is like, just to kind of like cut to the core of things. And I'm not that kind of guy. Like, I'm not kind of like the, that brash guy that is mm -hmm. just like, so you're quitting. Right. Like, I, I don't say things like <laughs> that, but I'll like, sort of like look at someone and I'll listen to their answer and I'll be like, just ask her a question. I'm like, do you ever think of leaving? And they're kind of like, huh? Like, is that <laughs> the owner of the business is asking me if I'm thinking of leaving. I'm like, it's okay. Tell me. 
And, and they're like, well, I've had thoughts of it. I was like, great. I'm glad you told me that. Like, so what do we need to change? And they're like, you're not mad. You're not like, I, I didn't really, I just thought we sort of do that in private. You know, we thought we sort of scan <laughs> career sites in the evenings and weekends. And I'm like, no, like, look, if you're not happy, like, I think you're great. You're doing a good job. How can we figure this out? And that immediately turns it on its head. Right. And I'll be honest too. I'm not like, it's all bubble gum. I'll be like, oh, that sucks. I'm sorry to hear that. I don't want you to feel like that. Yeah. Um, and it, it's frustrating to know that we haven't done better as an organization. I haven't done better as a leader, but like, what can we do with that? And so, I don't know, if there's, if there's sort of one major takeaway here, I suppose for your listeners, it's like, just like find that thing that's just below the surface and don't be afraid to let someone else in on it. Um, Cause it will change things. And by the way, for anyone that's like still like in classes with professors and stuff, professors don't get nearly enough of this shit. They <laughs> professors get the vocal minority that are complaining, not the, the, the kinds of students that go to them and be like, Hey, I didn't do well on this because X is happening in my life right now. Like it, or, or like, Hey, I actually spooked myself because I put so much pressure on this for this assignment. Like those simple things are really rare like shockingly rare um, in the mindset of a teacher or professor or faculty member, whatever. So like try it out with them, right? If you feel like you aren't performing well and you know why, and it's, it's keeping you up at night, tell them and tell them why. And you don't have to make them your therapist. By the way, that's the other side of this. <laughs> like if you get into really touchy stuff, you can't make people your de facto therapist. That's not good for anybody. But like you can say, hey, this is a thing. And you know what? That professor is probably in all likelihood going to say like, oh yeah, I've been there. I've experienced that. Or like, I know someone that has totally, that sucks. Okay. Let's figure it out. Do you want to rewrite the test? Do you want to redo the paper or what? Like, right. And so, and that's kind of how life works as I've learned. Awesome. Jordan, I really enjoyed this conversation, man. And I just want to give you some time if you want to promote anything or any last words that you have, you're more than welcome. Oh man. Well, okay. I would say this. So we are making a big push um, in 2022 on some of our campus work again. We sort of taken a bit of a sabbatical right now. Um, and so if any of the things that I've discussed are really resonating, um, we do have a campus version of our What's Your Big Lie program. Uh, we might have to retitle it because of the big election lie in the States. <laughs> uh, it was just kind of really messed with the SEO of the program. But if you just Google like Jordan Xani, what's your big lie? There's a bunch of stuff on YouTube or there's a bunch of um, links online. Um, but yeah, we'd love to bring that to any campuses. We, we do um, sessions virtually and stuff all over the world. Uh, sometimes I fly all over the world. So yeah, if there's ever, if you ever want to like get to the core or something, um, we're happy to team up with student groups all the time. The other thing I would say too, is like, if you ever need support, um, we do have a group of practitioners uh, that can support folks all over the world. So shiftcollab.com is our therapy practice. It's a smaller pool of providers that can, that can support people no matter where you are in the world, but we do have a bunch of them and they speak different languages and they're relatable and they love working with students. So don't be shy if we can ever be helpful. Um, but yeah, I, I just want to say thank you for what you're doing with this podcast and thank you for having me. This was a great conversation. Great conversation, man. I, I really enjoyed it. 